Hi, everyone. Welcome to IAS Thursday. I'm Jennifer Gunn. I'm the director of the Institute for Advanced Study. And you've seen some announcements rotating across your screen uh, while you were waiting for this to start. And I just want to draw your attention to one of them in particular. On Friday, February 19th, there will be a Human in the Data Symposium. Information for graduate students interested in applying for summer Human in the Data MinDrive fellowships will be posted on the IAS website soon, and we'll be talking about it at that symposium. Don't forget to check for coming events, programs, and grants on the IAS website, which is the very difficult address, ias.umn.edu. In our virtual world these days, the website is the portal to uh, everything IAS, including registration links for programs. If you want to get our weekly newsletter, send an email to ias at umn.edu. And just before we get started, I'll give you a few Zoom instructions. This is actually a webinar, and so uh, you won't be able to unmute yourself and ask your questions. At any time during the presentation, you can type your questions into the Q&A block at, uh, on the bottom of your screen. Uh, and at the end of the presentation, I will read the questions to Professor Schilling. Also, if you are interested in subtitles, click on the live transcript um, block and then click on show subtitles. I want to start by reminding us all that we are all residing on traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of uh, of indigenous people. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus is located on Dakota land, seated in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. The Institute for Advanced Study acknowledges that this place has a complex and layered history. This land acknowledgement is one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and community about the land and our relationships with it and with each other. The IES is committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and peoples. So um, our speaker today, it's a great pleasure to introduce him. Uh, Jonathan Schilling has been at the University of Minnesota since 2006, focusing on the study of fungi or mycology for those of you with good background in Latin. His research grants over the years have included three early career awards from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the University of Minnesota's Institute on the Environment, and the U.S. Department of Energy. Energy. He currently manages a laboratory of 10 students, postdoctoral scholars, and technicians on the St. Paul campus. Together, they are studying fungal biology and the fungal role in recycling carbon and other elements in nature. Jonathan became, a dire became the director of the Itasca Biological Station and Laboratories in 2018. If you haven't already, I encourage you to go north, walk across the alleged headwaters of the Mississippi, see snowy owls and beaver dams. Itasca is really a magical place. But to, to quote um, Jonathan, I came to Itasca with a commitment to the environment and with two goals. One, to take my research program beyond the microcosm and into the complexities of natural communities. And two, to reimagine the conservation roots of a scientific field station by welcoming all to collaborate and capture the light of a place. Please welcome Jonathan Schilling. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, Jennifer, it's great to be here um, in this, the Zoom realm um, uh, to give a talk to IAS. Um, I want to say thanks also to Abby and Rihanna for um, hosting uh, as well and helping me um, into this uh, Zoom world to give the talk. Um, I have felt very cared for, so I really appreciate that. Um, uh, it's great to be here. I was going to um, mention um, uh, and had asked Abby about this as well for the Q&A tab at the bottom. Um, I'm very interested in uh, crowdsourcing ideas and getting feedback, uh, not just questions. So um, these can be collected and I can read them later um, as well as answer the questions at the end of the talk. So I encourage you to give me some feedback um, because I am uh, you know, getting things going as the station director and um, interested in your feedback. 
Um, as I share the screen uh, for my PowerPoint talk here, um, I will also mention that I have never seen a snowy owl, um, despite being a, an avid birder and being up north uh, a lot. So uh, snowy owl will be, uh, and the great gray owl are on my list of things that I'm dying to see at some point while I'm up there. <clears throat> so um, let's see. The talk I've got here is uh, reimagining a scientific field station um, as common ground. Um, and I've got the talk divided into a few sections here um, that are kind of easygoing. I think they will introduce me um, and my history and path towards becoming uh, the director here at the station, um, the Itasca station. I'll give you a little background on the um, uh, biological station itself. And then um, I have some kind of open ideas uh, to share for how uh, these stations might be opened up a bit and um, utilized by others at the university than those have been utilizing them before as something I like to consider common ground. Um, so the first part here is, um, is sort of the path that I've uh, taken um, to get here. So um, I'm a partner and a parent, I've got a family um, and I'm a homeschool teacher because I have to this year. Um, so there are probably some others of you in the same boat. And I guess I'll mention that um, this talk has got a lot of pictures uh, that are, uh, should be kind of fun. So if your uh, kids are around, um, you might have some uh, that would enjoy this parts of this talk as well, I think, particularly if they've been to Itasca before. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, I've been here since 2006. I'm a professor in the plant microbial biology um, department, which is in the College of Biological Sciences. Uh, the appointment that I have is 30% uh, director, and uh, the rest of my appointment remains in research and teaching, 70%. So um, I'm still expected to do um, research, and I still teach courses. Um, two of these courses that I teach um, include, uh, or both are focused on fungi, uh, but include one that I call Fungi Koto, which is a fungi kingdom of their own. Um, this is a, a split level course in undergrad and graduate level. And um, the other course is field mycology, which is something that I teach uh, Itasca in May and June. Um, we are trying to run these courses this year in person if we can, um, and are hoping to make a call on these courses in Feb on February the 25th. Um, so uh, stay tuned for those, but I teach these courses that are very near and dear to me um, as a mycologist studying fungi. Let's see. So the fungi that I um, have focused my career on are those that inhabit wood. Um, these are um, an important group of saprotrophic fungi that are out there that happen to be somewhat charismatic in the microbial world, um, which is pretty helpful for teaching. Um, and gives me something to point at when I'm walking in the woods as an organism that's also considered a microbe. Um, these are organisms that have character um, and uh, they also impart character on wood when they degrade wood. Uh, so this is something I've uh, studied in deep detail in the lab, um, but that I also like to share that has some character in the forest. And so I've started to uh, collect these pictures of smiling decaying logs. So if you have any smiling decaying logs, um, I love these uh, photos, so send them my way. I'll give you credit and put them in my presentations. And I have a tagline that I um, use that I uh, is that I call uh, "With decomposition comes character." Um, that I've been using in my um, my email um, for uh, many years now um, as the tagline to the Schilling Lab. So in my lab, we work on uh, typically on single um, isolated fungi. And this is a picture of a fungus um, formerly known as Postia placenta that's now known as Rodonia placenta. And uh, you can see it growing here in a petri dish. Uh, this is a technician in the lab, Molly Moran, um, who is working in this picture to do an isolation of this fungus. Um, we keep these things alive and we do all kinds of tests on them in these isolated, somewhat unnatural environments um, that are the microcosms that I was mentioning uh, an interest in escaping here and there. Um, as sort of an indicator of where I am in my career and studying these organisms, um, the Department of Energy, where I um, had one of the early career research grants that Jennifer mentioned, uh, ran a story on me called Then and Now, which is, I think, a firm indicator that you've been around for a while. Um, and uh, this was a 10-year period from 2010 to 2020. Um, during this period of time, I did a lot of work with the Department of Energy. 
um, and had a lot of grants as uh, what's called the PI, the principal investigator. And in these studies of fungi, and uh, in large part um, in these single strain um, cultures, um, we spent about uh, $8 million in funding to go very deep into um, the what's called omics, transcriptomics, uh, metabolomics, and proteomics to really understand how these fungi work. And from these efforts, we have published a lot of uh, papers over the years. Um, this was all enabled by um, a 2009 publication in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of a, of a genome of this fungus, um, Postia. And this genome enabled us uh, to study a specific type of wood degrading fungi that's very common in the Northwoods, actually, um, that causes something called brown rot. And this is a carbohydrate selective way to degrade wood. Um, so it's an interesting uh, mechanism that was of interest to the Department of Energy. And uh, basically over the years, we went extremely deep to understand how it works. Um, so this is the fungus down in the lower left-hand corner, and I'll use this picture to um, kind of pivot to um, let you know a little bit about where my, where my head was um, at some point um, after uh, these many years of studying this fungus, and that is that uh, this fungus pictured is a fungus I've never seen in the wild. And I spend a lot of time outside, um, and it was a little disconcerting to work with such depth with an organism that I'd never seen in the wild. And uh, it's not because I hadn't looked, but it's a, a fungus you might find in the Pacific Northwest on Douglas fir wood, and it's just something I hadn't run across. Um, and you can see it's not exactly the world's most charismatic fungus. I'm sure it wouldn't appreciate me saying that, um, but um, it was kind of an indicator that we're working on some deep uh, mechanisms with fungi um, while there are potentially lots of other fungi that are out there that uh, we haven't explored with as much depth. In the last 10 years or so, we've uh, really expanded the molecular tools that are available to us to um, explore these other fungi. And um, uh, I was working in uh, great depth in a fungus that was enabled by a genome that uh, became, an, uh, in a, or became an option for us in uh, 2010, and at some point you go deep, you want to go deeper. And so there was, there's, there has been a lot of deep research into this one model system. Um, but uh, as this graphic shows, which is one that was made um, in the last two weeks by a PhD candidate in my lab, Hunter Simpson, um, there is a great variety of fungi out there. Um, and many of them do very similar things as Rhodonia, which is shown down here to the left. Um, and the bottom line is that this is a pretty way to show that there is a lot of diversity out there. And the genomes and molecular um, tools that are available, available to us to explore these um, have really um, uh, expanded dramatically in the last 10 years. So a lot has changed since I started going deep and I had an interest in my sort of mid-career uh, stage to begin exploring uh, what else is out there. Um, another thing that started happening was um, that I uh, began to ask larger questions. And uh, one of these was uh, about carbon that was being released by these fungi in nature. Um, we often uh, uh, buy carbon offsets that go into planting trees. There's been a lot of discussion about planting trees as a way to store carbon. Um, that carbon uh, gets sequestered, but I study organisms that re release it right back to the atmosphere. So uh, do we understand that process? Can we predict it? Um, the answer is kind of, but there's a lot of work to be done. And studying one fungus with great depth may not be as helpful as studying many fungi with a little bit less depth um, to get more breadth of information. So I was interested in, in that as well and asking some larger questions that related back to nature. Jonathan, um, yeah. I'm gonna yes. for just one second. Can you sure. try to stay, kind of hold your microphone closer? The sound is going in and out a little bit. Okay, Thanks. it's probably my beard. <clears throat> um, I can also speak a little louder, but please feel free to inter interrupt me if I'm still quiet. Um, the, uh, the other thing I think that began to happen was that there was another um, uh, group of uh, scientists that were doing great work to understand these fungi, um, many of whom uh, came from the lab, but some I began to collaborate with. And uh, there were a lot of uh, advances in the tools that I uh, honestly was having trouble keeping up with and um, was interested in uh, sharing this space with, with them. And perhaps um, what I had learned about the organisms uh, would be useful and uh, would give me a chance to explore them um, in a more natural setting and more uh, complexity. 
And so I was uh, interested in collaborating and growing the effort. Um, the other thing uh, that I think I began to feel that I think a, uh, a lot of scientists at this stage in their career might begin to feel is that um, I wasn't getting quite as much joy out of each of the publications that we were publishing. Um, they're very important uh, ways to share our science with those in the field and uh, those that uh, know um, the, the deep, deeper parts of what we're doing. So they're advancing the science, um, but there's a, a desire, I think, to share um, more broadly uh, what we're doing. And um, this I, I visualize as kind of being a little um, a circuit that we end up running. And so when we publish papers, uh, the papers will lead to um, others in our um, world um, responding, um, providing peer review, and we build networks this way. And by building these networks, we often uh, find ways to collaborate, and then we seek uh, grants in order to get the funding to do more science. And uh, we build in the science, which then produces more papers, and it keeps going in a cycle. And uh, in uh, some ways, this can begin to develop into something that feels a little bit like a bubble, um, depending on how broad your audience is. And for um, wood degradation by fungi, it's a niche audience. It's an important thing to study, um, but it's a fairly niche audience. And so I was interested in pushing um, outside of my little bubble. Um, another thing I think I began to be interested in was how I was sharing it um, uh, beyond my lab and beyond my world. And, um, began to wonder um, how many people in these kinds of settings, which are sort of what I would call the st sage on the stage um, setup, where you're on a stage and speaking to an, uh, an audience, um, how many of these people were going to actually disagree with what I was saying? In, in what kind of concrete ways. And um, the more time you spend um, at places like Itasca, uh, the more time you have at uh, places like this, which are like the picnic table or uh, doing a water walk with a bunch of people that happen to be at the state park. And those are the moments where I would run into more challenging situations where people would, would question what I'm doing. And I kind of liked that. And um, I felt like in some ways, if I could reach a couple of people over uh, lunch at a picnic table, I might be reaching more people than I was um, um, with my talks. Um, and I think in the end, it's different audiences. And so these serve different purposes. And I was interested in some of these more relaxed um, types of environments to engage. Um, another thing I didn't mention at, this, at the beginning, but I um, grew up in West Virginia and I've spent um, a good portion of my life in rural areas. Um, I now live in St. Paul, but um, moved back and forth between here and Itasca. And, at the time of taking the director job, I think I became interested in um, pushing beyond the urban bubble um, into the rural. And I think in the last um, few years, we've really learned what a divide there is. Um, and uh, this graphic kind of shows this. This is from the Star Tribune, and I modified it with more bubbles. <laughs> so I think I was interested in um, pushing outside of these bubbles because I feel like this is, um, at least for me, where a lot of the real work needs to be done. And, um, and as I'll circle back to show later, I think a lot of this may be happening at a picnic table um, rather than um, on a, as a sage on the stage kind of uh, environment. So I was interested in these things. Um, so with that, I'll uh, give a, um, a shout out to the Rural Urban uh, Divide Spotlight Series talks that are here at IAS. And uh, this is unsolicited. Um, uh, uh, shout out, but uh, it looks cool. I'm signed up for this and it uh, dovetails, I think, with what I'm talking about, some of the ideas that I have um, with Itasca. Um, so that's at 3.30, uh, same time uh, next Thursday uh, for a Zoom webinar here at IAS. Looks cool. Um, so these things were, I think, shaping uh, my thought process at that point in time um, and uh, were what pushed me in the direction of doing something different. Um, in this case, um, uh, becoming the director at uh, the Itasca station, uh, which uh, was something that I started on the 1st of January in 2018. So with that, there's the second of the, the three sections of this um, talk that I'll just call place. And uh, this is uh, about um, Itasca in the sense that it's uh, place-based um, place research um, as well as place-based teaching and engagement. And um, hey, Jonathan, so I, it's Brianna. Yes. I'm going to interrupt you quickly. We're yeah. we're still having sound issues. Is okay. it possible for you to take out the earbuds and just use your computer mic instead? I think that might be worth giving a shot at this point. Okay, sorry. 
it, we're catching some, but not everything. So we want to make sure we hear the rest of your talk. Um, can you verify how does this sound? That sounds fantastic. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Well, um, this part of the talk then is uh, is focused on Itasca as um, as a place. So um, if you haven't been there, it's uh, about a four hour drive northwest from the Twin Cities. Um, the station is located in southeastern Clearwater County. And uh, if you were uh, riding with me in the car, you'd probably stop a couple times to do uh, some mushroom picking. Uh, you might get bitten by a few uh, biting insects and uh, you would end up coming through the front uh, entrance here where there might be another event going on. And here I've got um, a sign for the wild rice camp that happens in September. Um, the station has 56 buildings, so it's a pretty large campus um, and it's pretty large for a field station in general. Um, 17 of these are winterized, so if you went there um, next week, even uh, with the cold temperatures, there would still be uh, some places to stay. We're, of course, dealing with COVID restrictions right now, but um, typically this is a station that is uh, open year-round um, with a, a rather large uh, set of facilities. Um, there are fields for um, athletics. Uh, we've got um, uh, at the bottom here, it shows the Biome Center. Uh, this has a seminar room that seats 150 people, and uh, there are some wet lab spaces and teaching facilities in there that are very modern, um, uh, that are quite nice. And uh, this is amidst some of the more rustic parts of the field station. Um, we have uh, a dining hall that uh, seats 130 plus the picnic tables outside. It's a very big source of pride for the Station. We have uh, four uh, seasonal kitchen staff workers with a fifth um, during high season. And uh, so this is an important um, part of the local economy, um, as well as an important contact point for people um, when they're at the station um, to eat together and uh, meet the staff. And um, it's something it's, uh, that I'm very proud about. Um, and then we also have cabins um, uh, as well um, that are both faculty cabins and, and student cabins. So if you're going into the seminar room, um, you would go past a lot of taxidermy animals and some other things that I could point out here, but it's, uh, again, it's a nice facility in the main biome center. Um, and you would end up in the main seminar room, um, which I think seats 150 people. And um, this is where I would give you the introduction talk. So if you've been there before, this is supposed to be uh, somewhat fun, but also a way to learn the rules. And um, I have it uh, uh, situated as let's orient. Um, uh, where are you when you get there? A lot of times the students will kind of unload from the van and not know where they are. Uh, maybe look at their phones on the way to the cabins and then they're in the seminar room. So they may not even know where the lake is. Um, so this is a way for them to orient um, and to uh, let them know who else is here. And uh, I almost feel like a camp counselor when I get to these moments of, uh, of being the director there. Um, but I enjoy them. So the field station is the first thing. I, I try to let them know what kind of facility this is. And uh, this is a place that's focused on place-based science. Um, we do research, but we also have uh, teaching programs and uh, increasingly engagement um, at the station. There are a lot of these field stations um, around the country and around the world. Um, so the organization for field stations um, uh, is a global uh, network that had their annual meeting last year I guess this would be actually two years ago now in, in Belgium. The Itasca station has been here um, since, 2000, or since uh, 1909. Um, it actually uh, had its roots in 1907 with some of the earliest forestry classes. Um, and it was a forestry focused uh, field station in its beginnings, uh, very focused on uh, preservation um, in sort of the Roosevelt era of trees. And uh, Itasca had a lot of old growth in which the forestry students could um, um, learn how to do their forestry techniques in, um, in a nice uh, setting. So it was a forestry focused uh, location until 1935. Uh, the station began, um, uh, I think, in line with some of the conservation efforts to preserve more than the trees alone, but to um, conserve the other um, aspects of the forests, um, particularly as people began driving to do recreation in our national forests. Um, uh, the station shifted to include biology, um, which also included a shift in gender. So we had more women taking courses um, at Itasca um, starting in 1935. And this is a picture in the lower right of the 1937 class. And uh, there's some uh, well-known people in that uh, picture, but I won't uh, select them out. But 
um, a neat history there. Um, the other part of the history that's uh, cool um, is some of the work that was done there to help uh, set aside other lands that are um, local. So this is a picture of Murray Buell, who was um, from Rutgers. He wasn't a University of Minnesota faculty, but was from Rutgers. Spent 23 uh, seasons there um, at Itasca doing uh, botanical work. And among uh, the several places that utilized his uh, data, the Iron Springs Bog uh, was established based on a lot of his information about orchids. And uh, Iron Springs is very close to the station and um, is a cool place to visit. So uh, normally at this point, I do a follow the dot thing with people that are visiting so that they can get a sense for where they are um, place-wise. So they're uh, at the time uh, inside um, the state park and at the station in the seminar room. So if you can imagine yourself being in that room, uh, we can go through the next few slides um, with you thinking that. So um, if you're the red dot um, in the seminar room, uh, you're on the campus there of the biological station. And, this is a 49 acre um, site that's within the state park. It's on a joint lease with the Department of Natural Resources. Um, the river flows there from the uh, alleged headwaters, as Jennifer mentioned, um, that goes uh, north. The Mississippi goes north there before turning and going south down to eventually down to the Gulf. And we have two parcels that are outside of the state park um, for doing science and demonstration there as well um, that are associated with the university and the station. Um, this alleged headwaters is uh, among many uh, headwaters uh, in reality, but most of the visitors that are there at the state park are there to see it. And so it, I, I can't deny that it's fun to walk across the headwaters. And we probably do this as a family, um, I don't know, I would guess 40 times a year. Um, and uh, I like to remind uh, people visiting that this is, again, it's one of many uh, headwaters to something that's a larger watershed. And, um, the activities we have along these uh, waterways in this watershed end up in the Gulf um, with some negative consequences in terms of loading nutrients into the Gulf and creating a hypoxic uh, dead zone down there. Um, so it's something to think about uh, while you're here at this pristine location at the headwaters. The park has a tall uh, uh, fire tower as well. And if you go up the fire tower, you can look west across um, uh, something called the height of land. And uh, it's a great view. It's um, not a lot to see other than nature. Um, and it's a, a wonderful, uh, fun activity. Um, you can also uh, see a lot of things that you don't realize when you're looking west. And so this height of land is a continental divide. It's the Laurentian divide that uh, divides uh, watershed on the other side of the land that's going ultimately north to the Hudson Bay. And on the side where the fire tower is, is uh, headed to the Mississippi and south to the Gulf. And um, that's just right there. And uh, if you're from out of state, it barely looks like a height of land at all. But um, there it is, the continent of the line. Uh, you're also on top of a terminal moraine um, uh, where there was a glacier up until about 10,000 years ago that retreated and left Itasca sitting on about 600 feet of gravel and glacial till. Um, so uh, this is something that's of interest. And it makes uh, the area hilly, along with having a lot of little pocket lakes. Um, it gives it a distinct um, feeling. You're also looking west across a very thin biome tra uh, transition. So uh, you are technically in a boreal forest um, at that location. But if you look west, you're looking um, across a pretty thin strip of the deciduous biome and into the prairie or the prairie remnants. Um, this makes uh, teaching there at the station um, a wonderful thing if you're interested in ecotones and looking at these different habitats. And it's also really great for research, uh, particularly research that's focused on the ecotone um, in the face of climate change, where um, these types of transitions are uh, the zones where you might find things uh, uh, that will uh, have to change um, relative to a changing climate. Um, the other thing, looking west, is you're looking in the White Earth uh, Reservation. And uh, the uh, White Earth um, Reservation is west. There's the Red Lake north and Leech Lake uh, to the east. And uh, so this location is um, an interesting one. We have uh, begun uh, collaborating with folks in, um, in these reservations, particularly in the White Earth. And uh, this is an opportunity to um, make these relationships um, uh, and also build them over time. Uh, due to the location and proximity. So um, if you were uh, following the red dot, um, it, when I give this talk uh, in person at the uh, station, I usually have people think about themselves going around the biking loop 
uh, which is a 16 mile biking loop and ending up back at the station. And then I say the station is a lovely place. Um, and it is, it's a really great place to hang out um, on, the, on the lake um, where there are canoes and paddle boards and all those uh, wonderful things uh, for, for hanging out. So the station is, um, uh, we have an associate director um, in Dr. Leslie Knoll. Um, she is fantastic. She's a full-time um, associate director who lives there um, as well. Um, she does more aquatic research while I do more terrestrial research and um, she's becoming kind of my partner in crime. She's a really great um, uh, mind when it comes to field stations uh, where she's had a lot of history working. Um, Eric Sather's our, our maintenance person full-time, um, who's kind of a jack of all trades and a wonderful person to talk to. Um, Lindsay Blake is the research technician um, who's there on Mondays once a week. And then Ben Fry is the uh, site technician who clearly enjoys uh, fishing. So this is a muskie he caught off Lake Itasca that um, I want to say is a 61 inch uh, muskie. Um, we have um, activity that is mostly focused in the high season and warm months. And um, I'll just point out one thing, which is the large um, red component in the middle, which is a CBS first year kind of onboarding program called the Nature of Life. Uh, this is an orientation program for incoming students um, that pretty much maxes out the station's capacity in, um, in July, mid-July. Um, but we have other groups that come up and um, um, have retreats there or uh, do classes uh, at, at Itasca. And I'll just point out that there are some gray spaces in there. So there's usually some room if you're interested in coming up to uh, run courses or have a retreat. And these two gray arrows on either side indicate that there's the rest of the off season as well that um, is pretty underutilized um, in terms of station use, but it's one of my favorite times to be up there. Um, uh, it's beautiful. It's good for certain types of research. Um, uh, at that time of the year, and uh, the skiing is really fantastic. Uh, so um, I will mention that. So this last section um, I call the common ground section. So um, that's those slides are kind of with my director hat on, and I, um, I do want to um, let people know about the facilities that are um, available there. Um, there's some components, uh, though, that I'm interested in, um, or I have been interested in um, kind of uh, uh, shifting around uh, to see how it might uh, open up the facility to more users who might be focused on uh, the conservation um, aspects or on generally on the place, um, which is the mission of the station. Um, so I did a few things um, to start. Uh, one of them was there was uh, some just some signage there. Um, and this seems like a very simple thing, but uh, this uh, sign on the left uh, was the old sign. Um, I had quite a few people tell me that it was a little bit disconcerting to see and that it was uh, something that would make you feel like maybe you weren't welcomed. And I've actually kind of felt this myself visiting the station. And um, so I got rid of those and uh, replaced them with the color green instead of the color red and uh, indicated that there was something important here. So you don't wanna go um, kicking mouse traps around or anything. There might be some important uh, research going on, but ultimately to let people know um, that uh, they're welcomed here, but to check in first. Um, sort of in the same, uh, same idea or same vein, um, we're uh, refacing an old building that's um, a, a spot that would collect people coming in from the state park um, to engage them rather than try to shoo them away. Um, so if you've ever been to the station, it's tucked within the state park. And um, having been there um, for a few uh, years, uh, you realize how few of the people that are visiting the park have actually been onto the station property because I, I think they feel unwelcomed. So the, this engagement hub will be a spot to give people a little bit more information about what's going on in there. Um, that this is uh, usually pretty uh, mundane, uh, but useful science. There's no, uh, there are no aliens being um, tested or anything weird like that. You'll, you'll hear some weird stories about some of these field stations that um, people began to wonder what's happening in there. Um, so it'll be a chance to talk about that uh, kind of stuff and then to engage things like tours and uh, visitors. Um, that are uh, there to, to be at the station um, in a kind of a controlled fashion at this location. Um, also, thanks to Dr. Noel um, Leslie, she has uh, really uh, taken our engagement game up a notch by um, involving um, or coordinating, collaborating really with the park. 
So the park has um, their own naturalists, um, uh, Connie and Sandra. These people are fantastic, um, as is Leslie. And so they have uh, uh, collaborated on doing programming that's available to the state park visitors. So this is a way for us to talk about what's happening inside the biological station. Um, it's a way to share what we know, but it's also a great way to learn what the public is interested in. And um, it's, a, it's a wonderful engagement. Um, opportunity that um, we hadn't uh, taken advantage of in the past. And so um, the park itself gets 600,000 visitors a year. It's the most visited state park in the Minnesota state park system. And it also has the highest number of overnight visitors, which is around 20%. And so when people come to visit the park, they really invest themselves in their visit. And so what better opportunity to engage them in science and, um, and the good that we are trying to do. Uh, the other thing we began was a newsletter. Um, the station didn't have a newsletter, um, so we developed this and we gave it kind of a folksy feel, um, as I would describe it, I guess. And uh, even in some of the writing that I have in there, it's kind of folksy writing um, that's approachable and which is, I think, my style anyway, and um, is a way for um, people to interface or interact with the station going goings on. Um, so this is called Upstream, and I'm sure you can Google Upstream Itasca Station and, and find the, um, the current the version of this newsletter. Um, I've also uh, been active in trying to um, engage local media um, there, um, including the papers, the, the Bagley Pioneer among them, and um, also, uh, uh, we engaged with the local PBS station, the Lakeland PBS, and so there's a um, PBS special about the station that uh, was aired at the beginning just before COVID um, last year. And uh, so if you'd like to check that out too, it's mostly focused on the field biology, a little bit on the nature of life. Um, and if you are familiar with uh, this type of PBS program, it's the classic PBS, local PBS um, thing. It's done very well by a person named Scott Knudsen. And I was, we were just so lucky um, to have this opportunity um, to show ourselves off in this kind of um, realm of PBS, of the PBS. So um, we really appreciate that. So that's another thing you can uh, check out. Um, uh, the other thing was some just general culture. I think a lot of these uh, field stations have had this um, kind of uh, uh, satellite approach to things where people that are um, working or living within the city um, uh, would like to study things in their natural environment. So they come out um, and then sometimes they're in groups and uh, you can get this kind of dynamic where you're away from the city, but you're tucked into the biological station um, and there are certain vibes that you enjoy while you're there, and it becomes a little bit of a bubble away from the main bubble. And um, uh, I thought this was a kind of funny because this was a newspaper article um, from 1907 that um, uh, indicated something that you could probably imagine even now. But uh, at the time, the, the first group of forestry students that came uh, to Itasca, um, they brought, I guess, their rifles and they killed some rabbits. And this was against the rules in the park. And so they got in trouble and then um, they got out of trouble after talking to the warden and the local uh, folks there didn't like this uh, because they thought this showed some favoritism. And so I thought this is 1907. Um, in some ways, I could imagine this happening now. And so um, I think we have to be pretty careful about how we behave when we're at the station. Um, um, and particularly when we are uh, going out uh, from the station to do anything, you know, pump gas and whatever. And so I think there's some cultural shift that's probably uh, an important thing for me um, to both model and to share um, with those that are visiting the station to make sure that we are uh, putting on a good face um, for the university there. Um, another thing uh, that I did was I uh, began a um, seed grant uh, program called Seed to Roots. And this was to imply that I was trying to get, um, or that we were trying to get uh, researchers to come up, uh, breathe a little fresh life into the research landscape at Itasca and perhaps have them um, dig in some roots there uh, for the longer term so that we can establish community and build the research program there over time. So these were uh, very successful. We were lucky enough to have these three researchers, Kyung Soo Yu, who I believe is a fellow in IAS, uh, working on invasive earthworms and climate feedbacks. 
uh, Trinity Hamilton, who uh, uses some uh, sort of next generation sequencing to look at microbial communities, and Peter Kennedy, who is using a or who is using a Smithsonian model for a forest observation um, in the old growth there at Itasca. Um, so these are new, and I think are um, are wonderful. So I'm very proud of these. Um, another thing, I, I guess I've uh, been trying to think through are ways to get. Um, or at least to open the door to other um, types of research. And one of these um, is that I'm showing here is an example is um, a biochemistry, biochemistry kind of focus. So our college and the College of Biological Sciences, we have a lot of medically uh, focused uh, work, biochemistry and uh, biomedical. Um, these might not be who you would imagine uh, ending up at the field station. Uh, we actually have quite a few of these folks come uh, for other retreats during the year. Um, but there are research opportunities, I think. And a good example uh, is this person, Osamu Shimamira, who uh, was a biochemist um, at Princeton. And uh, he used to spend part of the summer at Friday Harbor um, out in Washington State, which is a nice place, and uh, was working with a marine biologist and uh, discovered something called the green fluorescent protein there um, by working with uh, some jellyfish that were local to the region. And he would have never probably figured this out without working with some marine biologists and without spending some time um, at uh, the biological station. And uh, is an example of someone um, uh, who you might not think is a uh, is the normal fit for a biological station um, who actually found some great uh, research to, to do there. And I think there are probably um, uh, infinite examples of not just biochemists, but uh, perhaps people uh, doing history, um, the social sciences. I'm very keen on having uh, trying to um, interest people in doing social science um, in a place-based uh, facility like Itasca and, um, and, and even art. And I, um, I'll show you a slide here in a minute about how we are working with some, some artists as well. Um, another thing is um, to try to um, entice different experiences out of those that are coming. Um, so uh, with the help of the, uh, an American Indian fund that's through the College of Biological Sciences, we have um, started something called the White Earth and Itasca Internships, the We and I Internships. And uh, this is working with um, uh, a liaison who um, lives in uh, Ogama uh, named Becca Dollinger. And uh, she has uh, helped us uh, bridge between the graduate students that are working at the biological station with high school students that are uh, interested in science um, in uh, the general and the White Earth area. And so this last year, we had a student um, from Wabin High School, Logan, um, who uh, did some virtual stuff and had a couple of chances to meet in person um, working on uh, bluebird parasites with a, a University of Connecticut a graduate student and a technician. And the student learned um, with, a, with a big thanks to Jessica uh, Gutierrez, who helped um, advise this, um, but learned some uh, professional development as well as uh, some science. So it's a cool program um, that is uh, a little different for a field station. I've also been interested in uh, different types of courses that might be offered there. So um, I am very interested in trying to uh, entice uh, uh, other types of courses there. We run four courses. These are all kind of ology courses, animal behavior, mammalogy, microbiology, and mycology. Um, we have room to grow in the facilities that we have. And an example of a different type of course at a field station um, is uh, that I thought might be um, one that people know is uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer. So she wrote uh, uh, Braiding Sweetgrass is probably my favorite book um, ever. It's a wonderful uh, read. And uh, she also teaches an ethnobotany course at uh, Cranberry Lake Bio Station in the SUNY ESF system. And uh, it sounds like a cool class. And so I could imagine uh, those types of courses and um, other types of courses that again, might be related to some of those ideas that I had for research, history, social science. Um, so I think there are some opportunity there to grow the teaching as well. Um, we've also uh, got a proposal in at IAS for the a creative collaboration to do something called the Big River Continuum. And um, we tried to run uh, some version of uh, this before that was interrupted by COVID. And uh, this was an exchange uh, not only between the headwaters at Itasca and the Delta, 
um, at Tulane University um, and uh, particularly an arts and residence program at the studio in the woods, uh, but also do, do an exchange with two women, two indigenous women artists. Um, one was Karen Goulet, who's Ojibwe, and the other uh, Monique Verden, who's a Homa nation from Louisiana. And uh, we got about half of that exchange uh, before the COVID was done, and Karen had to take what she called the Mississippi Detour. Um, so uh, th uh, these artists have um, really led the way in terms of, uh, of us um, having an arts uh, and kind of arts science mashup at the station rather than simply using uh, science communication and using art as an instrument to share our science. Instead, we've kind of been working through the process of inquiry together. And um, I think the most amazing benefit that I didn't realize before we started doing this was the community that it can build um, and how fast. Uh, it's been an amazing um, opportunity for us to build local uh, connections. Um, uh, pretty much just by listening and by being there. So I've been very proud of this and I'm uh, really interested in this kind of experience-based um, engagement going forward. So the last um, slide here, or a couple slides, um, is going back to uh, just the concept, I guess. And um, uh, hopefully you heard me earlier um, that my microphone wasn't uh, that faulty, but um, I was sharing this kind of thought of being uh, uh, trapped a little bit in this cycle, or at least being interested in breaking out of it. And I think there are a lot of us that are interested in doing this um, to um, make our science um, um, more, uh, I guess, trusted. Um, and there are a few ways around this that uh, come to mind as avenues that we have already been doing. And one are broader impacts. So if you've ever uh, written an NSF grant, uh, it will typically have the broader impacts components. Um, this is something outside of the science that's supposed to be for societal benefit. Um, and often, uh, at least historically, has been uh, somewhat, or at least has been dinged as being moderately an afterthought um, that should be uh, more front-loaded in some of these grants. Uh, but the idea there is to do something for societal good, not just science. Um, another thing that um, many have been interested in, and uh, which I think is a very valuable pursuit, is data visualization. It's making your data accessible, approachable, and, um, and I would say even pretty to make it uh, something that you want to explore. Um, and also science communication. And I think, again, uh, this effort for SciComm is an, an important one, and that's become very popular. But in thinking through these things, these are all ways to take this circle, this recycled circle, and push it out of the bubble. And all of those arrows go away from the center, away from the core. And it's, in some ways, um, a little self-centered um, in that it's pushing um, what's inside out. And um, it doesn't include those things that might come back in. And this includes listening um, and uh, this idea of co-creation. And um, if we are going to try to push those into a position, at least like mine as a scientist, um, it's hard to do that without trying to figure out some way to get credit for it. And so I was thinking of this, you know, how to value this. Um, do we do this with credit when it comes to annual review time? And so if there are some other professors out there um, uh, in a faculty job, you may be going through this right now, I am, um, for your annual review. Um, is this something that we try to put in um, our uh, review documents to get credit for? And uh, do we also try to uh, establish this as involving some prestige? And I think both of these try to value something that makes it um, somewhat become a currency. And I think that could uh, subvert the purpose a little bit. And um, it's made me realize um, that this some place like the station that's really about creating space around this um, is probably the way forward um, to kind of pop this bubble. And so I um, will go back to this thought that, um, that maybe these spaces like ITASC and these field stations are a very valuable asset to the university for the sake of simply being a place um, without a script, um, a place where people can um, assemble without this narrative of getting credit for what they're doing and instead of that um, just being a place to listen and to be together in proximity. And 
Um, so this is my loose thought at the end of the talk. And I think um, was part of the reason that I felt like this was a really cool place to give a talk at IAS because I had a sense that in terms of maybe space that IAS does something similar in creating space for these unknown interactions that can lead to something important um, that might not happen um, otherwise under the kind of um, um, script that we're operating on in our regular uh, jobs at the university. So with that, um, I will, I think, turn, over, turn it over to Jennifer, um, and uh, I will leave this slide up for a minute um, here. I'm ready to take questions when you're ready. OK, thank you so much, Jonathan. And if anybody has trouble hearing me, I took my headphones off. But if anybody has trouble uh, hearing me, just holler. So we have a, um, uh, a couple of thank yous. Uh, uh, somebody who's been glad to see the late Professor John Tester recognized in the newsletter. And um, the first question is somebody who's curious about whether there are any efforts to use the Itasca Field Station housing infrastructure to support frontline water protectors fighting Line 3. You'll have to excuse me. I Part of that... <laughs> I, part of that uh, muted out on my computer. Um, okay, well, um, I'll read it again. Um, uh, the question is really, um, is there, has there been any effort to use the housing infrastructure at the field station to support um, the water protectors um, opposing line three? Um, not a concerted effort from from the station. So um, we have had um, groups that are that have been there. We had a group called the Anthropocene um, Project last year, which was an interdisciplinary group that was there that I think was very interested in discussing Line Three issues. Um, but uh, we haven't had any um, any concerted effort to do that for, um, as a station. So. I think um, we've discussed the uh, line three, you can imagine a lot. Um, the line three uh, uh, has, is in active construction right now. Um, if you go up there, you'll see these staging areas for, for line three. Um, we've discussed a lot about um, um, our role in, in that, in these discussions, et cetera. And I think the bottom line this year for that specific issue is that we have had some pandemic related staffing um, cuts. And we're in just we're in no position to um, to extend. I think we, um, in the sense of creating space for those discussions, though, would be um, would absolutely be open um, to those. But I think you know we would probably be in the um, uh, in the position to uh, try to enable discussion about those. Um, there are a lot of positive feelings about the line three there. And there are a lot of negative feelings about line three here in the cities. And I'm in St. Paul right now. So um, it's a, a something that I think conversation would be very helpful for. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers that, but I think our what we consider our role is as is, is a place to enable um, those types of discussions. Great. So this is more of a comment. So I think the engagement building, the engagement building that interfaces the university with park visitors is an important program. Um, you're right that in general, park visitors um, view the Itasca Research Station as a, as gated and off limits, uh, an off limits community. So the engagement center is a great project, and it's just one more way to advertise your work and connect with the community and the state as a whole. I appreciate that. I will say it's um, it's thanks to Leslie, um, to, to uh, the associate director there. She um, has made these connections with the park naturalists and the park naturalists are fantastic, um, just amazing. And they know a lot of the history um, of the station. They have all kinds of documents for us and it's really just unleashed um, the, the relationship um, that has um, not only the, the parts that are involved around engagement, but also with the park uh, superintendent who's new, Aaron Wunro. And um, there, it's got all kinds of collateral benefits um, to work with the park there. Um, the park also of interest, they uh, used to have a fire, a burn program for prescribed burns. And if you're a fan of Itasca, the red pines are uh, near and dear to people because they're in Preacher's Grove and they're very 
old growth, fantastic trees, and they are fire dependent. They need fire for regeneration there, and there hasn't been for um, I think 14 years since 2006, 15 years. So um, to get the burn program back on, not only requires getting somebody else up, up there to do it, but it requires public acceptance, which was the reason they stopped doing it in the first place. So I think um, there's there are some mutual benefits there. So anyway, a lot of collateral benefits, but I appreciate that comment for sure. So here, here's a very personal question. Is the field station a good place to study fungi? And is there a lab on the, uh, on the site incorporated into your course presentations? <laughs> I wouldn't be there if there was, if the answer wasn't a resounding yes to both of those. Um, it is, we have all kinds of, it's a, it's a cool facility. It's unusual for a field station to be equipped to study fungi, to do microbiology. I think we will end up being a front runner and being able to do field microbiology and uh, it's cool. Um, and that's enabled somewhat by the facilities and also the tools that are available in us now too. But I, the old growth forest for a fungus person is ground zero for awesomeness. You know, there, everything's there. Um, it's got a, just a history of mycologists coming up there to study it. It's like a paradise. So yeah, it's, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Do, are you all working at all with the Cass Lake Binna School District? And did I pronounce Binna right? That <laughs> hmm. doesn't ring a bell to me, no. Um, is that your question or is that from online? That's from online. Okay. Um, no, but if that person would like to give me in the comments to uh, more information, I would love that. Yeah. Okay. And I'm gonna take moderator's privilege here and come back to this question about community engagement and, and ask, I mean, I like the program with the high school students and some of these other opportunities, but is there a space for community, for community members to come and talk about their own questions and their own research that might be pursued at the station and how that collaboration could take place as driven by the community interests? Yeah, I think increasingly, I think, um, we have, I've learned for one that um, by having six seasonal staff that are all local there, plus those folks that work at the station, we already have a pretty good, uh, there, it's people know about what's going on at the station because of those connections. It's, um, it's something to be proud of, I think, that we have um, such a local cohort of, of staff there. Um, so that's an amazing tie in. Um, we've also had, uh, we've, for example, begun giving tours of the station. And so the, the science programming that we do, it draws a certain number of people. If it rains, you might get a few more people because they don't want to be in their campsites or whatever, you know, you like it kind of, it's a, it's a fun kind of crowd, but the tours, I think um, you'll get uh, some different folks in there that are you, that use the tours as an opportunity to see what's happening in there. And those have been a good opportunity, I think. Again, thanks to Leslie um, and Connie Cox, the, the head naturalist there, um, as a chance to, to talk with the community members about what's happening. Um, we've done some other things. There's a firehouse auction um, that uh, we've tried to attend in past years. Um, also connections that are made with the staff um, in doing that kind of stuff. Um, but I think we're um, interested more and more in um, trying to figure out other ways to engage the community. The arts program engaging with White Earth um, has been great. And uh, that's Becca Dollinger. I think um, uh, it's, she's been incredibly, first, she's very social and she's uh, connected with folks and she wants to bring people together. And um, so having just a few touch points or a few people um, as these um, kind of beginning parts of the network, um, it will expand, I think, really quickly. So I think we're really interested in doing that. It's, um, it's also for the, you know, for the record, it's pretty sparse up there too. So it's, you know, it's not like, it's not easy. You don't bump into people on the, on the sidewalk. Um, so there are certain meeting points and uh, uh, things like that, but there's a lot of word of mouth that uh, plays an important role in um, how these networks build. Um, so here is a um, correction to memory. The last fire was in 2002. So it's even longer than, oh. than you remember. Okay. <laughs> Fair um, enough. Okay. So, um, 
All right, here's just a comment about the Cass Lake, and please um, feel free to correct my pronunciation of Bina, but, or Bina. The Cass Lake Bina School District is one of the most disadvantaged in the state with many native students. They are nearby and could really use some kind of the, some of the kind of engagement you can offer and um, submitted a, uh, a link. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Also, I'll mention working in Monoman. Monoman is also it's the poorest county in the state. Um, and these um, programs, I think what we've this this Robin program, for instance, you know, we've run it twice. Um, and I think we've learned some things and we've done it by uh, keeping it simple and trying to build. And so that's um, something that's enabled by donor money. Um, that was from somebody kind enough to do that, who was a doctor in um, Monoman for, for many years and was very interested in, in keeping that program going. And um, these are the types of things where some, some kind of reliable funding, I think it's my job to try to drum that up, but so that we can develop programming that in, involves uh, trusting that it will be there again and having it be reliable um, in terms of continuity and how it's run, because there are ways to do these right and there are ways to do them wrong. Um, and so um, once I think we begin building these, these other opportunities become more possible because we know what we're doing. So um, I think it's a paced pr process, but I do, I appreciate that. So um, that's good, I, I appreciate that. Um, so uh, Becky Marty was the person who commented oh. on the fire program because she was the person who ran that at Itasca <laughs> and she did not mean to put you on the spot. And I was, she oh. didn't say correcting you. I was the one who <laughs> did. So I just want you to, to, to know that. Um, no problem. No problem. She's right. <laughs> 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 well, and, and we talked a little bit earlier about the newsletter recognition about Professor John Tester, and I wondered if you could just say a little bit more about his scholarship and his contributions. Yeah. Um, well, I was lucky enough to meet John only a couple of times before he died. Um, one of them was at Cabin One, which um, uh, is one of the cabins up there, um, but he uh, he, you know, it was, he was, um, you know, struggling with some of his medical uh, challenges, but was able to make a visit up there that I think was very special to his family. It was very special to me, um, too. That's thinking selfishly, but, um, I got a, another chance to hang out with him here in the cities, uh, before he passed away. And, um, I got a sense from John about who he was and what he was interested in. Um, and, uh, he, was he valued, I think, people a lot in terms of um, their capacities going forward. He was a champion of science. Um, he left me some recordings of his favorite spots for doing science um, to help me find those spots along the ecotone. Um, it was an indicator to me of his commitment to his research over the years. And I think he also had a deep commitment to the station um, and uh, he and his wife, Joyce, uh, Joyce has been a champion for me um, to, uh, to promote me. Uh, she's, they've been as much of, a, of uh, my cheerleaders as I have been for, for them. And uh, the Tester Fund was uh, created when he passed away as a way to um, uh, try to uh, generate funding uh, through the Tester Funds, um, uh, which is, if you looked at that news newsletter, you would see a link for that. Um, to enable research for graduate students. And uh, last year we had our first tester um, fellow, which was a graduate student, Daniel Brum, Dan Brum, who did fire history uh, using um, tree ring analysis. And um, having met John a couple of times, I know that he would have been psyched uh, by that research because it connects human history to fire history. It's got some cool um, uh, indigenous connections with uh, Native American communities and their connections to fire. And it has a purpose, which is to help uh, the station and to help uh, these scientists connect with the state park to begin the burn program that um, I think needs to happen again. So um, it's just very cool. And so I'm hoping with that tester fund, that's another thing with my director hat on is to make that a sustainable thing um, and in John's legacy so that these students can do the science they're supposed to do, but also to connect to his legacy, because I think he he appears to have been a, a really a, a model system. So, 
Yeah. Thanks. Um, I'll follow that up with a question. You mentioned that the burns were halted due to kind of public demand. So is, is there an ongoing conversation with the public about, about how to think about the burns and the possibility of restarting them? Short, no, uh, not that I know of actually. The, um, the park has all kinds of um, uh, interpretive stuff all over. I'm sure actually Connie would say yes, um, the, the, the park naturalist there. I think the park does. They, they have lots of interpretive signage that talks about fire, the importance of fire. Um, so I think they're actually, they're probably, there is quite a bit of, um, of an attempt there to uh, let people know that this is a natural part of the forest cycle. Um, and I think the idea here is that um, we can add to that by helping uh, in the programming and offering some of our own and also tagging in scientists to the program that's ongoing at the DNR, um, as well as be supportive of the new superintendent there who has more knowledge of burns than I do. He would know probably that it was 2002 or, or what, uh, the, the, the year that Becky told me um, there, he would know that. Um, so uh, he's, I think, on board um, with that as well too. But um, yeah, in terms of anything specific that the station has done, we haven't, but I think the park ha um, has. So here's a question after my own heart. Are the field courses open to the general public uh, and continuing education type students? Yes, that's the, that's the answer that I know is true. Um, in terms of the specifics of how to sign up, I'm not 100% I'm not sure how it works, but I have asked this of our associate dean of undergraduate education and he assured me yes. Um, so they're open to all. We have um, a certain number of students each year too that are from outside of the university system too, and they're all welcome. Um, we have lots of scholarships. Um, some of them are earmarked for University of Minnesota students, um, and they uh, pretty much will defer the tuition and room and board um, that it takes to be there. Um, and uh, there are some of these that are um, um, have the capacity to fund people from outside of the university too. So. Um, yeah, the more, uh, well, at a certain cap, actually, if we run those courses this year, um, th this is the, the bear of doing administration. So you might be in the same boat. It's, it's hard to figure out um, how to make plans that you can break later. <laughs> and so we were kind of in this process of figuring out what we can do and what we can't in order to offer in-person classes at Itasca. Um, so we'll, we will likely cap those courses this year for uh, the, re the reason of COVID safety, I'm hoping we can run them. Um, and in future years, uh, push that cap um, upwards. Um, but uh, please, yes, please uh, check out the courses. Great. Well, um, we're going to draw on Becky's expertise again, because she said John was key to the, um, sorry, just scroll down. John was key to the burn program and all the resource management being done in an ecological uh, manner. And a lot of what was done for the resources wouldn't have happened without his energy. And she also mentioned that Aaron, the park superintendent, worked on that last burn in 2002. Okay, um, okay follow-up question about the courses is the field mycology course going to go through in 2021 specifically the field mycology course it's definitely going to go through um or it will go ahead um what it looks like you know is not a done deal but we have a graduate section of that course um that is already in in progress so the graduate students take these courses this is without going into the weeds about funding for some of the grants um, it's important for them to be signed up as uh, in the spring semester um, to then spill into this may june section so the graduate courses are already going but the undergraduate students will enroll february the 25th for um, the university of minnesota students and then i believe it's march the 4th for those outside of the university um, but the, my, these courses, the mycology course will definitely go um, no matter what. But um, I would, you know, I, I really don't think they'll be online. We just might have to um, be clever. I, I think ultimately it's most likely that we'll just have to set a cap and that uh, we'll be clever in where we go to look for our fungi. But it's Itasca, so it, I mean... I think my co-teacher in that course, Peter, was asking, like, what do we do if we don't have, if we can't use the vans like we regularly do? And I said, there are four directions, northwest, east. I mean, there's stuff in all directions. We can do stuff anywhere. So um, it's a really great location. So we'll figure something out. So, uh, it'll go. 
<laughs> okay, that sounds good. And um, uh, actually, this is exciting news. Um, John Tester wrote Minnesota's Natural History, and the University of Minnesota Press is bringing it out in a second edition this spring. So uh, look, yep. look for your notices from the University of Minnesota Press and order the second edition. It's, uh, it's beautiful. I've got it downstairs, hard copy. I already got it. And it's <laughs> It's affordable. It's um, it's a great book. That's fabulous, and I just want to draw your attention to um, Abby Travis's um, Re Robin Wall Kimmerer reciprocal lichen story in the chat. Um, <laughs> so um, I think we're at the end of our questions, but I just want to say thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. Um, and we will hope to see you all next week for the Rural Urban Divide. Same time, same, uh, not the same Zoom link, but, but re-register. And um, thanks again so much, Jonathan, for um, the gorgeous pictures, the uh, accommodating my historian's questioning of, the, of where the headwaters are. I might be totally wrong here. I just thought uh, I remembered somebody questioning. <laughs> I think it's valid. It's valid. But we still, we have, the people come for it. So I have to be on board. It's the headwaters. <laughs> As a Southerner, my family was thrilled to have pictures of me walking across the headwaters of the Mississippi, which they could not even begin to contemplate uh, <laughs> for, further south uh, on, the, on the river. Um, so, and I once was at Itasca and saw a white owl, and I just assumed that was a snowy owl, but it Probably might it, yeah. have just been a plain old white owl. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's got to be a snowy owl. So I'll, I'll try to get up. I'll, I'll go looking for one and I'll let you know when I find one. <laughs> okay. You just made my day. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing all of you and Jonathan also uh, again soon. Take care. Thanks. <laughs>